Alrighty. We're on. We're on. Yes, we are on. So I'm sitting here with Daniel Mitchell, the storm. The storm. So to speak. Now, I guess uh, for people who don't know you, so currently you are going to go compete at IMAF Worlds. Yes. And that is in February. Yes, February 12th. In Serbia, of all places. Serbia. Yep. So, um, and I guess let's let's probably start a little bit with the martial arts journey because I think that's probably a good place to start and then we can sort of wind the timeline back and talk about all the other things that you do. Yeah. So when, when did you start martial arts? I started martial arts um, when I was 14, yeah. Oh, I was at 13, I was, yeah, I was turning 14, yeah. Yep. So I was um, right into my rugby lead at the time, yep. playing rugby lead, making like rep sides kind of thing. And then I, was just, I remember a coach just told me, oh, you should really try freestyle wrestling, the Olympic wrestling, because I was good at oh. the defence side in rugby lead. Yep, so you like, like tackling people. Yeah, they were just saying, <laughs> it's like no one doesn't seem to get past you. And I was like... Oh, yeah, but I could never find a gym where I was living at the time at the hills. At freestyle wrestling, like, I had to go, like, into some academy. Um, mm. And I just didn't know what to do with it. And then, yeah, well, my neighbour at the time was a good mate of mine. And he happened to have an Xbox and he happened to have the USC game on the oh, Xbox. No yeah, so we were playing um, USC. And I remember I, it was BJ Penn versus J, JSP. And I... Um, yeah, I was looked into it. I'm like, oh, I want to do that jiu-jitsu. Found a local gym and, yeah, that's where it all started. Wow. Started doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu when I was um, 13, but pretty much turning 14 and, yep. yeah, here now. Yeah, wow. So uh, the first place that you went to for jiu-jitsu, was that uh, Universal? Yes, Universal yep. Combat Academy with Simon Farnsworth. Yep. yep. Okay. And so when you, like, so you were the one that would have had to approach your parents and say, hey, I want to do this or? Yeah, well, my, my parents have always been pretty... Um, Lenient with me with the sport because I've always been into sport. Like no matter what I've been doing, I've just been a sportsman all my life. It was like my way of communicating in a way because I mm. had a speech impediment when I was younger and I wasn't very book smart, but I was athletic. So I always do all the athletics carnivals, the yep. swimming carnivals, and I was actually quite good at them. Yep. So yeah, they just um, encouraged me to try it, and yeah, I, w- I went there and. Yeah, mum didn't really know too much about it and dad didn't either. <laughs> so when they learned a little bit more, it was like probably I was four years deep until they go, oh, I don't want someone trying to rip your leg off like they just saw. <laughs> 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 but yeah, no, nah, but yeah, just, that's how it's all started. Wow. Okay. So uh, talk me through like, you know, and, and the reason why I think it's interesting is because you trained uh, jiu-jitsu as a kid, right? So teenager, like young teenager. So technically I'd still say a kid at 13, right? So um what was that like for you? Like, I guess, did you did you click to it straight away? Obviously, because it was your idea, it, it was probably easier for you to gravitate towards, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, kind of did. I just, because at the time at Universal Combat Academy, the kids class were, like, really young. Mm. And I was um, 14, playing rugby lead. I was a big, big, lot bigger than all the younger kids there. So mm. I got thrown in the deep end with the adults. Mm. And... Yeah, just wrestling bigger people all the time. It didn't really phase me too much because I was always a small football player. Yeah. So versing like you know the real big Kiwi guys, <laughs> Aust- yeah, Australians is like it didn't really phase me too much. So I wasn't scared of anything. Yep. And yeah, I just got thrown in the deep end, and yeah, kind of picked it up from there. Just learning where to move my body when someone's so heavy trying mm. to sit on you, and yeah, like I learned to fight off my back pretty well mm. when I was young. So yep. yeah, that's. That was one of my um, attributes, just fighting off my back. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess for people that uh, are, are listening, right, so in terms of size, you, you compete at Bantam, right? Yes. Yeah, so Bantam is 61, is it 61.5 or 61.2 or something? 61.2. 61.2. So, you know, most people when they think of like a, a, a rugby league style football player, they're thinking of blokes that are probably, well, I suppose if you think about it, like Volkanovski was a footy player as well, right? Yeah. <laughs> and he, he would have been over 100 kilos at some point. Yes. Um, but most of them, you know, uh, are fairly bigger bigger boys. Yes. Um, you know, we're talking guys that are probably, say, you know, getting closer to six foot and generally over 100 kilos because, you know, the weight helps um, when you want to blast your way through defensive lines, et cetera. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. So, so um, you know, when you – I'm sort of curious about how you went – you know, and why you sort of gravitated towards defense, especially when you would have had like much bigger boys running at you. Like, was it? Were you ever scared of it? Like when you first started playing? No, I just believed in my ability. I guess it's like I did um, jiu-jitsu and wrestling to actually help me with my rugby lead okay. because I didn't stop playing rugby lead till I was seventeen. Yeah. Okay. 
17, so I was still towards heading that rugby league stuff, but I was in love with the sport jiu-jitsu at the time. And I was like, yeah. oh, like I'm using some of this stuff on the football field. It's <laughs> making me feel stronger. I'm getting on top <laughs> I'm getting on top of the bigger guys this time. And, um, yeah, so it really worked in that favour. But, like, what you were saying with the weight vantage too, is like I kept making, like, I was like I wanted to make the next level. Like I was trying to make the Parramatta Juniors, Parramatta Eels Juniors, this, that. And it's like, no, you're too small, you're too small. So, yeah. it, at the time, it was so hard, like, trying to they wanted me to put on weight like eat two chickens a day this and that and like yeah. put it on weight and then it's like i want to do a jiu-jitsu comp and it's like I but i can't do it yeah <laughs> it's like i can't do it at like welterweight or anything because that's the size they wanted me at and i was like going as a young age like still i was fighting at 66 at the time in jiu-jitsu like i wanted to do some roles and then from there i just wasn't i, I think i did one year of jiu-jitsu first before i committed myself into a, a comp because yep. i was like no nah, i want to be 100 percent ready mm. and yeah and blitzed it like and then as a kid's comp and then i went into the adults comp that same day and blitzed the adults comp and i was yeah, just like wow. wow i like this is this is cool yeah like, yeah so and that's the the love of jiu-jitsu started but i didn't want to let go of the rugby lead at the time mm. yeah until i made the decision when i was 17 yep. yeah so uh when you made that decision when you were 17 like was it an easy choice or were you still umming and ahhing like i guess what was the thing that sort of tipped you over um i guess i was playing i made the top team at the time at the at, uh where i think i was playing for the bulls at the time yep hills and bulls yeah hills bulls yeah <laughs> i made the top i used to sponsor that team <laughs> oh there you go yeah. well i made the top team there and then the next following year later, they dropped me. Oh, wow. And then I was like, I can't be in the second division team to try, make you know, the NRL. Mm. And I actually moved to another club um, called Marconi, mm-hmm. Marconi um, Mustangs. And then I played my last year of football there. But unfortunately, I was competing with like, for the position I wanted to play, I was competing with like the top guy at the time. Yeah. So there was even some games that I was missing sit, sitting on the bench the whole time. So you didn't get to play. Yeah. What, what position were you trying to play? I was playing hooker at the time. Hooker. Yeah. Okay. I played halfback at 5A and then I went into hooker because my tackling ability. Yeah. Like, it's like, oh no, no one can't get past you. you. You're in the middle of the field. We need you to yeah. get the bigger boys down for us. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I was playing that position and then, yeah, then I realised I was like, maybe this isn't for me and then, in the meantime, like when I was 15, 16, I was competing in jiu-jitsu and I was winning the John Will Machado Nationals. I was going through the ranks and in the um, belts and the stripes. And like, I didn't, I think I've only graded for my blue belt and the rest were just all given to me because I was just dominating the comps at the time. Yeah. And then that's when I thought, oh, you know, I know, like I wanted, rugby league was my dream, but then all of a sudden the passion was going back to jiu-jitsu more. And then mm. I picked up boxing when I was 16 too, and okay. I did 10 amateur boxing fights and then everything was just flowing. And it was like, it's like, why would I give up something and chase something that um, I don't think is there, which it wasn't there. Yep. And just getting told, like I could have stayed at it, but I was just loving the martial arts side of things the boxing the jiu-jitsu and i said no i think this is what i want to do and and yeah so i was like if i'm gonna have a go i'm gonna have a go properly yeah yeah it's really interesting because i think uh, a lot of the smaller guys like us smaller guys when you think about athletes and sports people right majority of them that are competing say like whether it's basketball they're all tall right you know there's only there's some notable exceptions like the mugsy bogues and spud webs like these shorter guys um shane heel you know, Alan but even he, he's, not, he's not really even that short, Shane Hill. I think he's yeah. like 5'10 or something, 5'9 or something like that. Yeah. But, you know. Um, not like us, 5'7. Not, <laughs> yeah, that's right. We're like the midgets. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I, what, it, what it sort of uh, allows us in combat sports is it's sort of like you have this um, clean, clean slate playing field because you're only competing against guys who are at least weighing in on weigh-in day the same as you. Yeah. <laughs> what happens after is whatever happens after. The weight category <laughs> yeah. pick, yes. Yeah. So, uh, it, but it allows for like this um, really niche kind of skill development where, you know, if you can't go and be a basketballer or you can't go and be like a, a track and field guy or a swimmer or something like that because you don't have the physical attributes, um, you might be physically strong and have the right ap- attributes for your size, but it's just when you take a, a somebody who's 5'7 versus somebody who's 6'3 and athletic and blah, 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 it's, it's a different ball game. They've got the advantage. Yeah, yes. they, they, they have they have advantage. And, you know, it's, it's funny because a lot of the reasons why people uh, start martial arts is because this idea that, you know, as the smaller person, you can beat a bigger person, right? Yep. And that absolutely rings true if the bigger person is untrained and you're trained a hundred percent a hundred percent then that that was one of the things that drove me to jiu-jitsu too like you just saw like i'm 
when I looked up this guy, BJ Penn, and watching him, I'm like, holy shit. And then you you read about jiu-jitsu, what it is. Like, oh, yeah, it's for the little guy to defend. But yeah. Exactly. And it was like that for a while. But until that bigger guy knows what he's doing, yeah. it's a little bit still can do a lot more damage than what you can do yeah. to them. Well, but I well, kind of learned that growing up too. Like, yeah. One of, one of my mates, um, he <laughs> it's the worst analogy, but I'm going to use it because right, I think it's funny. It's like, he's, he's like, oh, you know, um, He's, he's talking about dick size, right? And he goes, you think a guy with a big dick doesn't know how to use his dick, <laughs> right? Like, so it's like, it, if you have that size advantage and you're technical, it, it becomes a whole other problem. But likewise, the same thing applies if you're a smaller size guy, but you're more technical than the bigger size guy, you've got an advantage. Yeah. And then if you then add strength and conditioning and all that, you know, uh, in conjunction with it to supplement your training, you can take away a lot of advantages that a bigger person has. That's exactly right. right yeah. And then you go into like the world of mixed martial arts where hey, if you're a better grappler than the guy, he might be bigger, he might know how to strike, but he can't grapple and you can take the, the, the fight to the floor, well, you, you've just taken him to the ocean where he can't swim. Exactly right. right? Drown the lion. You drown the lion. So you find all of these different avenues and that's, that's something that I, I really love about um, martial arts. It's, you know, I don't like the... I used to be very, you know, single discipline style person and then over the years, it's like you realise that, hey, no, it's... You realise it's more about the individual and working out what is the game that works for you. Yes. Right? And then... And that... That's fed from, you know, a little bit from your coaching. So where you've trained and what is the sort of game that they've instilled in you. But then there's this real um, point where I would say, like, say, as a, like using jujitsu as the example, right? So when you're a white belt, you're taught, you, you learn whatever's taught to you, right? You don't know any better. You don't have, know any of the jujitsu jiu moves. You don't know the vocabulary, the positions and all that sort of stuff. Then, you know, you get your blue belt or your purple belt and you really start to then explore what works for you. Yep. Right. And then you start turning something that, you know, people have fed you the words, but now you're making the stories. And that's the thing that I love about martial arts is that, you know, when you when you start to really start to understand things or, or you start to things start clicking yes. and you go, oh, OK, well, I can do things like this. And it may not work for somebody else, but you might see a way to make it useful for you. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. I like to tell the white belts that all the time. Do what's taught to you and eventually you make the move yours yeah. the way you do it. Yeah. It doesn't have to be done like exactly how I do it. Because it's the way I do it. Yep. You eventually, it's your move. Yep. You make it your move. Yep. Yeah. All right. Let's, uh, let's wind it back a little bit, and we'll come back to martial arts um, towards the end. But um, where, where did you grow up? I grew up in the um, hills, Castle Hill. Okay. Same yeah. as me. Yeah. yeah. There you go. So um, school-wise, wh which school did you go to? I went, um, I did my primary school, Excelsior Public, and yep. then I went to Gilroy College in okay. high school. Yep. Yep. Okay. And then, um, I guess... Memory wise, like what are some of your, what would be some of your earliest memories? Like, can you remember anything from when you were little? Um, what sort of stands out? Is it something to do with family? Is it something to do with school, friends? Um, just sport, like really, just sport. Yeah, like I was um, apparently I was deaf as a baby, so I obviously had a bad speech. I couldn't speak properly because I couldn't hear anything. Really? Yeah. So I had a lot of speech therapy. My mom. Uh, that's probably the youngest, one of the most things that I remember when I was really young was. Um, Constantly going to a speech therapist, trying to learn how to speak, um, learn my sounds. Because obviously, being a baby or a toddler, um, without my family not even real, oh, not my mum and dad not realizing that I could, I could only hear half of the word kind of thing until I started speaking. And they go, "What's this kid speaking? Like, what language is he speaking?" Yeah, because wow. like, yeah, I couldn't understand the English language because of my ears were so blocked and and. I had operation to open them up and then I had to pretty much do it again, relearn how relearn to speak. everything. Yeah. So do you remember anything? Like how old were you when, that, when you had that operation? I, th I think I um, was pretty, when I started speaking, maybe three. Wow. Three of, yeah. So you wouldn't remember it, right? No, I don't remember that, yeah. no. Yeah. yeah. But I remember just, I think I had grommets in my ears. I always used to have a bleeding ear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I remember that going, going through school and yeah i guess that like that's why i said i use sport as my communication to get involved with the, everyone mm. yeah i did anything anything i could try and i ended up being pretty athletic from it i was doing athletics all the time like i did little athletics and then i was a swimmer i was very i made the top squad in swimming yeah yeah so that was my way through school pretty yep. much yeah because i wasn't i couldn't do the work like i had i do rep remember repeating year two yeah i had to repeat year two because i just wasn't where i should be Yep. Yeah. So isn't it amazing? Like we, I think it's something that we we all take for granted. We don't really think about um, those really early years and and how <clears throat> how they can sort of help you develop or put you behind. Yeah. And it's not for you know it's not uh, it's just oversight really. Like how how was anybody to know something was wrong 
until you started speaking and then was, your parents started going, mm, like, it's not making sense. That's exactly right. Yeah. right. Have you got any siblings? Yes, I got a I got a younger brother and two younger sisters. Oh wow! So you've yeah. t- family of four. Yeah, family of four. Ha- I'm the oldest. I, I, I'm I'm a bit curious about the dynamic, right? Um, in so I've got three uh, at the moment. <laughs> so, in terms of like you know a family of four, like I think most people would look at that nowadays and they go, "Wow, it's a, that's a big family, right?" Yeah. Um, for you growing up, like, did you ever feel like? It was weird or anything, or did you actually really enjoy having a big family and having those brothers and sisters in the room? Well, I definitely enjoyed having my brother because he was only eighteen months apart. So we're like best mates, yeah. and we're one, we're both hyperactive, so we did everything, everything together. together. Yeah. So and he Handful. was, <laughs> yeah. And when he was younger too, he was doing all the sports with me, so it was, yeah. just made life easy. That was a breeze. Like your brother was your mate, and you live with him every day. <laughs> so yeah. That was that made it a breeze, and then yeah, and then just having the youngest younger sisters just. You know, be the big brother. There, yeah. I think there's ten years apart with my sisters. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Ten years apart. Yeah. Well, um, my younger sister's exactly ten years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then my other one would be, she's twenty one. I'm. Tw- oh no, she's turning twenty one. I'm turning twenty six. She's five, five years. years. Yeah, five years. Yeah. yeah wow. So five ten. Yeah. Yeah. That's a big gap. Yeah. Your parents are gluttons for punishment to go back and do it again, like, <laughs> twice. <laughs> Might be an accident down the road, who knows. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. But you still, uh, you know, I think, um, I don't, like, so my, I've got a seven-year age gap with my elder brother. Yep. And for me, I remember, like, I was the younger one, so for me, I always looked up to him when I was growing up. So it was sort of cool because, for, cool for me, probably a, I was a pain for him because, you know, when he was, you know, say 17, uh, here I am at 10 trying to do 17-year-old things, uh, which doesn't really, you know... Uh, work out for him yeah. <laughs> and and he probably thought i was you know uh, really annoying and things like that whereas I, I always wanted to hang out with his friends and do the stuff that he was doing you know listen to the music that he was listening to and getting yeah. into the things that he was getting into now you remember being you're a lot mature for your age this is like my little sister some of the stuff that she comes out with you're like holy man i didn't even I know didn't these even things. know these things yeah, yeah. it's like it, you watch it you're like, Whoa. it's like i learned everything when you have older siblings you learn quicker yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. True, yeah, you, you watch them and then, you know, I see it with my third. Um, she'll pick up things from both her elder siblings and their, their age difference is only, so they're six, four and two. Yeah, um, there you go. So they're only two years apart between each level, I guess. Uh, but she'll pick up things from the six-year-old, she'll pick up things from the four-year-old and it's cute in some sense, but it's also annoying in some sense because, like, you're a, two, you're a two-year-old trying to do what a six-year-old does. Like, it's it's not meant to be that way. Like, do two-year-old things. Yeah. <laughs> do your two things. Yeah, yeah. 100%. So it'll be the same thing with your young, your younger sister, right? Like, she'll yeah. be, you'll be like, what, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> it's like, dude, yeah, you got a phone now. I didn't have a phone until I was in year eight. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it was, it's funny watching that, eh? Like, mm. it's like, I didn't even know these things and then it's like, puberty was like, didn't even know of until like year eight. It's like, they already knew it at like year five, year, it's like, oh shit. Yeah. yeah. So, out of curiosity, you know, when you uh, repeated that year, did you actually know what was going on? Like, do you remember? Yeah, I remember it was a very emotional time at the time, yeah. I think, like, even, like, a, I got a, a puppy for my birthday. Like, I did, that's how, like, emotional <laughs> it was kind of thing. It's like, here's a puppy, Daniel. <laughs> yeah, because I obviously had all my friends. I had, I had a really close friend in um, the year that I was in, yeah. and then I had to repeat, knowing that he was going up, I think you go into a, after year two, you go into a primary school. Like, we're in, so I had to stay in infant school. Yeah. Yeah. So, knowing they were going up to then, it's like, I can't even hang out with my, my people friend that anymore. I know. Yeah. So, yeah. so that was hard to restart it all again, mm. but I managed and yeah, I've got made friends there. But yep. yeah. So, it was a bit weird. And I guess I, I think I remember at the time it was just hard. Like, you're sitting in the class there and you just, you know, you're young, you're thinking, oh, you know, I wonder what everyone thinks, like, yeah. these kids doing Yeah, very self-conscious. Too. Yeah, I was self-conscious at the time, yeah. yeah. But um, but it was just the sport that got me. I, honestly, sport was the thing that got me through it. Yeah, like, lifeline. Oh, yeah, <laughs> lifeline, really, yeah. It was yeah. the only thing I could do yeah. like, that made, like, even when we used to go outside, I used to always be the one, like, mm. dictating what we're doing. Like, yeah. yeah, like, anything to do with sport, it just made sense to me. Yeah. So, yeah, if I, that's how I learned and used sport. Yeah. yeah. So then from the speech therapy side, like how long did you have to do that for? I didn't think, I think I went all the way until high school. Yeah. I didn't stop until high school. Wow. Yeah. yeah and, and obviously helped a lot. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I can speak properly now. <laughs> I, I still struggle sometimes when I try to pronounce words. It's like the sounds in words, yep. like here and there. Um, but yeah, other than that, like I, um, it definitely helped. Mm. Yeah. So um, as much as I hated it, thank you, mum. <laughs> <laughs> Forced me to go. <laughs> yeah. did, did you have any favourite subjects in school? Um, PE. <laughs> yeah, yeah, obviously. <laughs> Just the sports stuff. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, other than that, I wasn't really, like, because of the whole um, speech therapy side of things and stuff like that, I never learnt, taught myself to read. I still struggle to read myself if yeah. I had to read it on paper. Yeah. Like, it's easy to do this because it's all coming you straight from... the sounds. Yeah. yeah but um, reading was always a difficult thing for me, so yeah. it was always hard. Like, I had a really good mate in my English class, I remember, and we used to have to read the book out loud, and you used to whisper in my ear, so I didn't make... Because <laughs> I was always so worried making myself look like a fool. Yeah. Yeah, but... And in the end of the day, I just kind of learned to embrace it, use the joke, let the, you know, because I, because I thought I was so, um, because I was my sporting ability was so high, yeah. and everyone looked at me for being that sportsman guy yeah. and winning everything. Um, I guess when people tried to use, oh, you know, Daniel can't even fucking read this, yeah. that, blah blah blah, like I just let it happen, let them have their little joke. And I just played along with the joke towards in the end in high school and I had a blast through high school. Yeah. yeah. It's sort of, uh, you know, when you have like a, a weakness like that, um, using it as a strength, like you sort of, if you, when you're, when you're open and agreeable to it, like you accept it. Yes. It, it's much. no longer a weakness, right? Yes. But if you were very, still very self-conscious about, and I know there's probably an element that you still have this self-consciousness about it, but, um, but because you're open about it, it's very different to if you like didn't want to talk about it and you didn't want to sort of let anybody know kind of a thing. I feel like uh, that's when it, like, you know, when somebody's going to pull at that, it, it's really going to hurt. Yes, that's, yeah. yeah, exactly right, yeah. yeah. So I learned to deal with that too, yeah. yeah. Like, you do get your moments, but yeah, you just go, oh, whatever. But I also wonder, you know, and, you know, like, I wonder whether that, that also helped to contribute to your drive to want to be successful in sports and athletics and all these other things, right? Like, you sort of, there's this, I would always say it's like, and, like, so for me, as a kid, and the example that I would use is say, um, I was a very overconfident kid, right? Overconfident to the point you, I was the cocky little prick, <laughs> right? But really, bro. Yeah, yeah. But being the cocky little prick is is actually I'm compensating for something, right? Like obviously I'm I'm insecure in myself. Yeah. That I need to go and do all of these things to sort of make up for that. Yeah. Right. And I think everybody has some form of insecurity, right? Um, but then the question is, how do you actually channel that emotion, right? Do you channel it into doing productive things or are you channel it into doing horseshit and, and just doing negative things, right? Yeah. And I feel like, um, you know, uh, you, you, you channeled it into a positive thing in, in terms of exercise and athletics and all of these others and sport, right? Versus you could've, it could have gone the other way, right? You could have um, dropped out of school. You could have, you know, gotten into drugs. You could have gotten into, you know, all this other stuff that is very negative. Yeah, that's right? exactly right. Yeah. So... You know, uh, so I, 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 when I say that, I don't mean it in a, in a bad sense that you, you sort of use it, you're investing yourself so heavily into like sport and all those other things to sort of compensate. I think that's a good thing because you need to find these obsessions that sort of help you to be, find who you are. Yes. Yeah. I, I totally agree with you. Yeah. That's yeah. what, it, I guess that's what one of the main things that people used to tell my mum and dad when, you know, when I was like, oh, you're stepping into a cage now. I to, <laughs> like to bash people and this and that. It's like, hey, your son's. You know, he <laughs> trains every day for this. He's like, he's not out on the street thugging around, doing drugs, this and that. Like, this is what he does every day of the week. And, yeah, that's in, in exactly what you're saying. Like, you know, I use sport for my distraction of my insecurities. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, and that's how, I, like I said, just communicated with the world and yep. grew up in this sport. Like, and I, it got to a point where I was doing too much sport. Like, I didn't know, like... My goal was to be successful in sport no matter no matter what cost it was. Like, yep. I, like if it was athletics, I'm going to be a 100-meter sprinter. Oh, no, I'm not fast enough. I can't keep up with those guys. <laughs> so now I'm going to be a long jumper. Well, you know what I mean? Like, yep. I always wanted to do something. I always used to tell my mom, like, man, I just want to watch in the Olympics. I'm going to represent Australia for so, like oh, in something. the Olympics. Yeah, yeah, I was like, I want to make the Olympic sport, this and that. And, like, the Olympics were in my head. And then the rugby league came involved. And I got – because when I started getting better at rugby league, because I played rugby league when I was – Six, yeah. and then I kept going through, and I was like, I'm oh, getting better and better and better. I'm like, oh, maybe I can maybe make rugby league. Like, just everything I tried, I mm. went 100%. No matter what sport I did, I went 100% in it. Like, yeah. I even did like bull riding, I went hard in that because bull riding, yeah. Hol holy fuck. Let's let's we gotta go on a tangent here. So, let's let's talk about this bull riding thing. So, how did it start? 
It all started because of my um, dad's side of the family, yeah. um, the Mitchell, my last name Mitchell, um, they're all um, country. They're all like in, in West. Like yeah. they all run stations and farms and stuff like that. <laughs> and we're like my dad's dad at the time, he used to run a farm, but he moved to Sydney for work and that's where he um, finished right. the rest of his life. Yeah. yeah. Um, so my my dad's sort generation now, like us, we stayed in the city, but we'd still go out and see family in the country. Yeah. And yeah, we, I think there was a rodeo coming up, went to watch it, and then it just started off with like a couple of drinks at dinner, just like, oh, you wouldn't do it. Like, this is a bet. And then I did it, and I was like, I, I can do it. I was like, yeah, I'll do it. I've got, got all the stuff, had a go, did all right. And I was like, ah, oh, hang on. And look up rodeo PR. I was like, like, oh, these guys are making a million bucks for this stuff. If I can just hold on to this thing for eight seconds. Really? Uh, yeah. Wait, so, wait, wait, wait. You make a million bucks for holding on to this bull for eight seconds? Yeah, not not in Australia, but okay. if you make it professionally, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I was just like, oh, this is seems cool. And I didn't get hurt the first time, obviously. And then <laughs> tried it the second, the third time, got all the gear. I was like, oh, man. And that, that, was, that was the thing with me. But I just didn't know what I wanted. Hmm. Um, and even though I still... But the thing was, I always had jiu-jitsu to always to come back to. Mm. Like, I, either, I tried all these things, but jiu-jitsu was always there for me. Yeah. So, but like I said, every time I did something, I did it 100%. I didn't do it half ass. Yeah. But, yeah, so, and then I tried to do that 100%. And then I think um, I was still balancing that up. And then I think it was, like, when I was doing my first MMA fight and mm. I decided to do a rodeo at the start of the year and I didn't think much of it, but... Mm. I had a fight book for like early March and then I rode a bull got, and then, you know, that's a most dangerous sport. I, got, <laughs> I was stomped on the chest. I expected broken collarbones. My throat was swelling up and lucky I came out of it fine, but I had a concussion too. And it's like, I was like, oh, you know, and now I've got to try, i got to tell my coach I've got a fight coming up. I just got concussed. I can't have contact for two weeks or something like that. Yeah. It's just like, then I realised, you know, okay, you got to pick one, Daniel. Like, this. but that was that that was that was where my stupidity come from. Um, yeah. Just putting too much effort into something. I always went a hundred percent in, and then <laughs> and then it's like I think I um, a wise man told me like, he just told me just put everything in the one basket and you just focus on that. It's, you can have all the tools and only use them um, their fifty percent of their capability. Mm. But if you just pick that one tool and use it to the hundred percent, then that's that's what you want. Yeah, yeah, to focus. Exactly right. So, okay, I, I need to talk a little bit more about this bull riding because it's just <laughs> I, I, it still astounds me the thought process. You know, getting on the getting on the piss and then go, yeah, I can do this, and then getting into it. So the first rodeo that you did, right? So uh, I'm guessing so they 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 do, they do you sit on the bull before they open the pen? Yeah. So they <laughs> put all the ropes on the kicking rope behind its leg, and you're sitting on it, and it's obviously. It won't jump until the gate's open. So you're in this little cage with the bull or <laughs> the chute. And, yeah, and then they, the guy that opened in the gate will ask you, you ready? And you go, yeah, you're ready. And then they let the bull go and you, it jumps. Wow. So how long it, did you stay on the first time? I think it was like five and a half seconds. And right at the bull, that's a long time. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, wow, like did pretty good. And then... The second time... Wait, wait, how, how, did you, how, did you, how did you get off? Were you thrown off or...? Yeah, they throw you off. <laughs> yeah, so the bull's <laughs> bucking and you're just holding on for dear God. Yeah. I guess um, I never really had a fear factor in it. Yeah. That was probably the most dangerous thing about it. I reckon if I had fear, I wouldn't have done it. Yeah. But um, I just wasn't really scared at the time. I thought I just an adrenaline junkie. I'm like, oh, this is my thing. mad. I'm going to try, I'm gonna try this. <laughs> like, you know, I've wrestled... Bigger guys at jiu- I've read some massive guys at jiu-jitsu, a hundred plus kilos, this and that. It's a uh, bit of a different animal. Like, did, yeah, you tr- did, did you try and renake the bull? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, it's just, just holding back control. Yeah. <laughs> but little you know, you've got only one hand holding your hand, you've got to hold another hand up in the air. You know? uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> you need good yeah. hooks. <laughs> yeah. And unfortunately, that's a big stomach to put hooks in. <laughs> yeah, true. So then, okay, so then the, the last time that you did it, when you got the injury. So what happened in that one? So... Um, I just, I felt like I just wasn't tied on properly, but it just, no matter the thing, I just, the the gate opened, the bull threw me off. Straight away? Yeah, threw yeah. me off straight away. Like it wasn't, I probably maybe one second. Yeah. And as he's thrown me off, he's kicked in the air, but when he's come back down, I was on the ground and he's- Landed on hit you. Hit my cage, or he had a helmet on, hit the cage and landed on my throat and pushed back off. Oh. Yeah. And um, 
And because, like, obviously I don't remember it because it was such something happened yeah. so quick. I wasn't knocked out unconscious, but um, I must have, like, clinched my teeth that hard when it hit me. I actually chipped all my teeth. Oh, but, wow. Yeah. And um, I just remember getting up and, well, I don't, actually, I don't remember getting up. I just remember being in the, like, shoot, and my brother's, like, got a big bowl of water like this pouring on my head. Daniel. Daniel, you good? Like, you're right. Uh, the bull just stepped on you. Like, you're right. And, like, everything was just, uh, what the hell's going on? Like, I just, I felt like I was in a cold shower. Yeah. And not knowing that I just rid a bull. Yeah. And the next minute, um, did you keep asking what day it was? No, nah, not even. Oh, okay. I didn't even remember any, uh, like, I don't remember walking to the ambulance. I was yeah. in the ambulance um, truck and all I would just come back to reality saying, is my teeth all right? And I got like showing the doctor my teeth. Yeah. And it was just like, and that was it. And then I remember like, oh, teeth, this and that. And then and I see like my dad, my brother, my best mate at the time. And then <laughs> I just like, I'm in the ambulance. And, I go, oh. and then, then I asked what happened. He's like, oh, see, so you don't remember. Yeah. It. But because I got up, like nothing happened. My brother didn't think I was concussed. concussed. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, most, most people don't realize, especially if you've never really spoken to somebody who's been concussed, right? You, you re- they start asking the same question on repeat. Like, yeah. they're stuck in this loop. Yeah. And um, they go, oh, you know, oh, wh- wh-, like, say as an example, it'll be like, what did you hit me with? Or, like, it'll be something like that. Yeah, my brother said the teeth thing. Yeah. He goes, all you kept saying is your teeth. Yeah. Is your teeth all right? You're your on teeth loop. Are right. Yep. Yeah, because obviously um, I remember f- having that feeling like there was, like, Something's something wrong. sharp in my mouth. Yeah. And I was like, my teeth, and my teeth all right, my teeth. And my brother goes, you just kept asking me about your teeth. Yeah. And, <laughs> like, and like, I, I, to this day, I don't still think he... No, it's like I was completely out of it. Yeah. 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 So funny that. Like yeah. once you takes, had a, bit takes of a lot to put me down. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. You need to you need to be stomped on by a I'm bull. You're gonna be stomped on by a bull, yeah. Oh wow. Okay. Um so okay, let's go let's go back to high school. Cause I, I'm curious, so when you finished high school, um, did you have any idea what you wanted to do? Um Yes, yeah, so as I was leaving high school was when I was in my last year of um football. Mm. And that's when I said I'm gonna take Footy seriously? No, not my footy. Oh. Um, fighting. Okay. Yeah, I was like, I want to get into this MMA now. Like, you know, I've done ten boxing fights. Went back to jujitsu. Um, I think I got graded to my purple belt. Went un- undefeated in purple belt, mm. and then got my brown belt. I'm like, no, nah, I think it's time that I'm going to take this to the next level. Mm. And that's when, that's pretty much when I started focusing on everything. Like the bull riding was just like a little episode. Like probably <laughs> six months, I had like four <laughs> rides. And then I was like, all right, that's enough. Yeah. yeah, yeah this Tick that box. Can move I on. Think, but I think getting hurt by the bull was the best thing for me in a way. Like I had to learn the hard way to realise what I really wanted. Mm. And then that's when, I re- that's when it all clicked. Like, actually, no, I really want to do this. Mm. Like I really want to do this MMA. I've got the cap- I know I've got the capability of doing it. Yep. Yeah, I just needed to get that one fight out of the road and then – Bang, like, because I did the pancreation mm. um, and went undefeated in pancreation. They asked me to go to Russia, this, that. And at the moment, I didn't, I didn't have money then. I was mm. like 18. I was like, you want to go to, I just finished school. I have no money to go to Russia to fight for the world, this and that. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, I was just trying to get out of that real amateur stage to get into the amateur MMA. Mm. And then I finally got into that. Yeah, had my first fight. I actually lost my first fight, mm. but I did do, um, my first fight at 70 kilos. Okay. Because just to... I think at the at the time they couldn't find someone at 66 for me. But that was my jiu-jitsu um, competition weight, 66. Yep. And um, they couldn't find someone at 66. And I was thinking I was walking at 67 at the time. Yep. And then Luke Bazzuti's just like, oh, we've got a guy, Michael Standoff. He wants to... He doesn't... His opponent just pulled out on him. My coach didn't want to... My coach said, oh... He at least cut to 68 kilos yep. and we'll fight. And then, you know, Wayne's calm, this, that. Um, he's still way overweight and I've rocked up at 67, this, and that. It's like, oh, you don't have to fight if you don't want to. Like, no, this is my first fight. Like, That's I just knew it. I needed to break in. Yeah. yeah. And that was like my break in stage. And, you know, the lights, everything, it's just, oh, it was, this is like, this is what I want to do. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, let's, let's go back a little bit because let's talk about the boxing first. Yep. Um, and I think one something that's probably interesting for people to hear about is the difference between boxing training and jiu-jitsu training in terms of instruction style. Yeah. So how did you find uh, – and, and I don't mean that in, in any disrespectful way to say that one teaches better than the other. They're just very different in how they approach yep. uh, teaching. Yes. Right? 
So I guess what did you find, you know, when you when you were trying when you're doing boxing and you're doing jujitsu in terms of like how are they trying to educate you in, in, in each of these sports? And then I guess was there any particular method that you used to try and help yourself get better faster? Um, I feel like jujitsu is a lot slower in the way that we teach and we learn in techniques and then we wrestle at the end. That's when the um, high intensity stuff is at the end. But what I felt with the boxing training was constantly high intensity, mm. you know, and we're doing footwork, like a lot of footwork. Like we, everyone thinks, you know, you do boxing and it all starts from up here, but the way you're striking. But yeah, my, the coach at the time was just so big on my footwork, getting my feet light and movement. And it's just all about moving right and skipping, like just getting super fit, light on your feet. Yeah. Yep. And just like high intent. Like that's, that's what I feel was the most difference. And I think I just, because I was already so fit naturally, like I was running cross countries and winning them too. And I was like, um, I just like that being fitter than everyone else. Like, yeah, every it's time another, I, another thing to have in, in, in the back of your yeah, mind. I guess that's what the boxing, like when I was out working the boxes kind of thing, like in fitness wise, I'm like, oh yeah, like it made me feel good. Like it just made me feel great that I was fitter than some of the guys. But obviously it didn't matter when you were in the ring striking like the better person would win all the time but because of my fitness was there i could keep going round after round after round after round and i think that's what i just liked about the boxing was just pushing my fitness to the like to the extreme like mm. to the what a lot of people call breaking point but i never broke mm. i just just loved the feeling like holy man like i've done a huge workout but i'm still i'm still going, I'm like, still going yeah, yeah. Yep. so that was a, that was a that was the thing that i liked about um boxing and yep. Also, to less um, injuries. Yes, injuries. <laughs> yeah, just with jiu-jitsu, because I was always the smaller guy in the gym, yeah. um, it was like that until um, I was 18, yep. pretty much. And it's just getting niggly injuries, getting twisted yep. um, in jiu-jitsu and being really sore afterwards. I wasn't getting that in boxing. Yeah. Like, I'd wake up the next day, I could do the same thing again in boxing. Then. Yeah. Next day in jiu-jitsu, oh, man, I'm going to take it easy on my... On my elbow this time I landed funny on my elbow Yeah and it's just Or your back Yeah your back <laughs> yeah. yeah And then um, Yeah I think The reason why I went to boxing For a good solid Year I did it for a good solid year And only did jiu-jitsu Once a One night a week Was because I think um, We all caught Jock like the ringworm In oh. the gym And I just treated – I didn't know what it was when I was a kid. I was young. I, was, I had to ask my school teacher what this was on my skin. I said it was so itchy. He goes, oh, that's a ringworm. Do you, do you live with pets? I go, yeah, I've got two pets. And he's like, yeah, you normally get it from pets. Little I knew you get it from jiu-jitsu, right? <laughs> so – and then and when I went to the doctors, got all that healed. It was all – I was all – I was like, cool. Went back to jiu-jitsu in the gym and then like that week again I got another one. I'm like – Oh man, and then I just stayed, and I just got told by the doctor you can't be on the mat until it's all gone, kind of thing. Yeah, it's like so, and that's when I chose boxing. Like boxing, we weren't touching each other like we yeah. could pass on jockage. And I got once I got rid of it, I just stayed at boxing, and because of my boxing, uh, like I said, I always put a hundred percent in it. It's like, do you want to do a boxing fight? Yeah, let's do a boxing fight. Get get a win. Oh, let's do another one. <laughs> I just had 10 boxing fights in one year. It was like, that was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Like I went five and five, but just the doing experience. It. Yeah. Experience. Yeah. 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 I think that's people, what um, people don't, people underestimate the amount of experience that you get just, just by getting in there. And yeah. it's also uh, getting time, you know, in the ring, in a competitive environment where it's not just like, I, uh, there's two schools of thought, right? Like you need the lights, you need the pressure. Um, some people, you know, really struggle with the pressure. And other people like they don't they don't feel the pressure. It just depends on your personality, really. Yeah. But you know, getting in there and knowing what you're expecting is a very uh, important thing because then it doesn't really change anything. Like I, I for me, I treat competition just like training, really. Like it's there's no different. That's um, how you should. Yeah. Yeah, and it doesn't feel any different to to training. You know, if you're training right and you're training hard and you're getting the right sort of work in, uh, it won't feel too too different. Even though you know people will make it up to be this really crazy thing. Or there's now more pressure because there's a title on the line or there's this or there's that. It's the same. Like, you know, I think for me, what I realise is that like, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day whether you win or lose. It doesn't change your life that much. Yes, that's right? exactly right. You know, you, you win these things and, and this is the thing, like, it's um, you need the ego because you need to feed it if you want to be competitive as an athlete. But at the same time, it's like um, this 
sometimes the ego is really bad for you because you become fearful or worried or anxious about, you know, what's going to happen after. Yeah. Well, the reality is not a lot is going to happen after. It's going to be the same. You're going to wake up the next day. You might be a little bit sore, you know, here, there or wherever. Whether you won or you lost, you're still going to basically move on to your life. Like, it's not like you just go and hang on that last fight and you go, oh, that defines me. You know, um, my career's over or, you know, I'm, I'm the best in the world. Like, so what? That's exactly right. right. You get you come back to reality pretty quick. <laughs> Exactly right, and I feel like sport is. Um, I'm massive um, on my mental health, mm. um, and everyone should be. Like, yep. I just feel like you know, if we're you and I lined up for a fight, right? Mm. You train as hard as you need to train the way you need to train. Like, you train the way that you feel like you got to fight, yep. and I train the way. Like, it doesn't be the same thing, but you're training for a fight. I'm training for the fight for the. For the, we're training for the same thing. Yeah, I always say it's whoever mentally rocks up on the day, and yeah. like you were saying, like you treat competition like it's training. Yeah. That's like how that's how you should leave it. Like you do the you do the you do it every day in the gym. Yeah. What's the difference going into like just a bit of lights in a crowd? Like yeah. you know they can't. And I felt like a couple of times, and, and that's why I was good being so young in the sport. I guess in even in jujitsu comps, boxing comps, whatever. Um, is learning that mm. you can't let pressure get to you in a way and like i remember even when i fought for my first title like people were coming in and because we were so close with the the guy that will fight in his gym they used to come for sparring and mm. stuff like that and they they always go you know who you're versing you know he's really tall this that and it's like no i don't i don't know and it's like have you watched him yet i was like no like <laughs> I'd, I'd get that like i i do the all my hard work here so as long as i'm putting the work in the gym like yeah. Put it, like I said to you, like pushing myself to the max and always training. When it comes to game day kind of thing or fight day, it's just we've worked so hard for it. Just trusting your training, yeah. you know? Like don't let pressure get to you now. And, like, and that's where I feel like my confidence grew too with my mental health. Like mm. I remember um, when I was back at UCA, I was a lot – I was like not cocky, but I used to be like – talk it up a bit like confident like this is where the storm nickname came from mm. stuff like that. like you can't control me like i'm like the weather like the storm outside <laughs> this and that and um and it was like a in a way using that confidence as a distraction of how nervous you are for the yeah. actual event you're compensating yeah that's exactly right so yeah just talking it up yeah. in the gym but still putting the work in but now it's just like you don't need to do that like to me i and that's the whole, that's what i love about martial arts it's the whole learning there's a, there's a never-ending road with martial arts yeah and, um, just learning where what works for me. Like, you know, I remember when we were playing football, people would wear this certain colour underwear because that's what they had to wear on game day. Like, yeah. Everyone asks, what's my ritual now? It's like, no, no ritual. I just turn up. Yeah. It's like to the gym. You got a six o'clock class, just turn up. Yeah. Turn well, it's, up. it's, I think there's also this element of, um, and I think, you know, it's very, you, people ver find it very difficult to translate skills from other things that they do. Yeah. Right. So, as an example, <clears throat> when you're competing, you get very good under pressure, right? But then, if I was to go and ask some of these athletes to then go and give uh, a public speaking talk or something like that, they'd freak the fuck out. Yeah. Right. But it's actually the same feeling, right? You you under the lights. You got all these people watching. You you've got a crowd of say you know 600, 700 people. You got all these people watching online. Blah blah blah. blah. Like, what's the difference between that and then talking into to a room of say 100 people? Yeah, exactly. there's no difference. Right? Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. And, and or likewise, you know, um, you go and teach a class, you know, as an example, you're talking, you know, in front of 30 people and then I ask you to do a public speaking talk and people freak out and they go, oh, uh, I can't do that. You know, I'm not good at talking. It's like, well, you just taught 60 people in a room, you know, you, you obviously had no issue in, ter in terms of articulating content there. It's the same thing. That's where the mental side of things come in. It's like, oh, I've never done that. But, yeah. But if you think about it, like what you just said, like, but you just taught a class with 30, 30 people and like you have to explain every little detail so everyone gets it and you got to make sure they're all doing the right thing. Yeah. You're actually doing a lot more than just standing in front of 100 people just yeah. speaking your mind. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's right. So yeah. using, using stuff to help you yeah. get over things that you've never done before, actually you have done. Yeah. yeah. And, and so because that's one of the, the key things about, um, you know, the martial arts world and, and I guess for combat sports, right? Because... You can't do combat sports forever. Like when I say you say that, you can't compete at the highest level for extended periods of time because, you know, father time is going to catch up with you at some point, right? Yeah. Definitely. So you need to um, either develop yourself a, a good enough platform that you can do other things with it, yep. right? Uh, whether it's, you know, you're then going to teaching or coaching or whatever the case may be or 
um, you know, if you want to get down like the jiu-jitsu instructional path as, as is very in vogue at the moment, um, like there's so many different pathways that you can use to make a career out of it. But if you just rely purely and you, and you, and you think to yourself and you pigeonhole yourself and you say, all I am is a, is a fighter, well, you've just cut yourself short on all of these other opportunities that yeah. you can then go and create a career from in, in your life after fighting. That's right. right? And, and as much as, you know, people never like to think about it, like I, I think about it a lot because, you know, I, for me, you know, fighting's just fun for me. Like I'm, I'm 38. I'm, I, I've said this to you many times. Like I'm not out there looking to try and make a career from it. But I've created a career from doing all these other things that are related to fighting because that I enjoy. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think it's really important that, you know, um, first of all, that fighters got to understand that if they want to uh, create a platform, people need to be invested in who you are. Right? And that's why I think the podcast is great because then I can invite people on and share their stories and do those sorts of things. Because, you know, otherwise, like, if you're, all you're doing is you're just watching um, two people fight and there's no storyline, like, you think about every big organisation, the things that they sell is the storyline more than anything else. Whether it's, you know, uh, McGregor Diaz, yeah. right? Or McGregor Khabib, like, that, what was the storyline? Like, there's so, so many things that they, they cut up for promotional footage and as much as people go, some of that's really dirty shit, like, you know, like him throwing the dolly through the... Through the, the bus task. window, yeah. yeah. But like people remember the stories, yes, right. And we think we when we whenever we remember any great rivalry in combat sport, we remember these stories, and that's what gets invested in the person, right. Um, and so you know, being able to be truthful to who you are and 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 being open about your story, like that's actually inspiring for other people. Like especially you know like um, I, I I didn't know that you had a a speech impediment. I didn't know that you, were, you, you know, you had these, this problem with your ears and I wouldn't have known unless I actually sat down and talked to you and actually did this podcast. Yeah. Right. But knowing that it's like, oh wow. Like, you know, for me, like I, I'm always sort That's of, story. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm always starting to psychoanalyze people. Like, you know, I'm like a pseudo psychologist going, oh, so that's why Daniel's so, so invested in athletics and martial arts. You know, he's, he's compensating here. But, <laughs> but like, I mean that he's in a good way. He's hiding stuff. <laughs> no, but like, you know, you, but you, you, you've, you've come to terms with it as well. Yeah. Right. So you go, okay, where's my skill set? Okay, this is my skill set, right? Yes, that's a weakness of mine. And, and over, over time, you will slowly, you know, work on that because all, all it is is just, you know, you getting obsessed with something in that that's more related to that field that will then make you then go, okay, I'm going to work on this a little bit more. But right now, all your attention is focused on this thing, yeah. right? Um, which is great because I think, you know, uh, it's that quote, uh, the Miyamoto Musashi quote of when you see the way in one thing, you see it in everything. Mm-hmm. So you've got to follow this pathway until you're happy that you've done everything that you should have done with it. And then you then look at, okay, well, how do I apply that to the next thing? So, you know, as a samurai, you know, he, he, he's not only a, a great swordsman, but he was great at calligraphy, he was great at carpentry, he was great at all these different vocations. And I feel like, you know, um, there's a lot of that mindset where people will say, oh, you can't do all of these things, right? And, and I think there, there, there's, only, there's a portion that of that is that is correct, which is like, Daniel, if you want to go and be the world's best carpenter, the world's best martial artist, and the world's best this today at the one point in time, yeah, you can't do that. Yeah. Right? But in 60 years' time, you probably will have ticked off a whole bunch of things in, in combat sports. You might have ticked off some other things in your other interests. There's nothing stopping you from them going and becoming a painter or a writer or any of these other things after you've gone down this pathway of doing it in the thing that you love at the present moment. Yeah. Right? And that's the thing that I think is beautiful is that – um, we always forget that when we see somebody, we're seeing them in a snapshot. You know, like uh, I do a podcast with you today and we talk about, you know, your story so far. You know, we, we reconnect in 20 years and we talk about in 20 years' time. We go, oh, look at all the other things that we've done, right? Yeah. Like it's just purely – and that's why I say, like it, it doesn't change your life one bit what happens in that fight. Like you, you, it's done in the past. You move on. You go to the next thing. That's exactly you right. put the next goal in front of you, you chase the next goal, and then when you're done with that, you go, okay, you know, I'm still going down that pathway. Well, you keep following that road until you decide, okay, I don't want to go down that pathway anymore. I want to do something else, like the radio thing, right? Yeah. You went 100% down the radio pathway, and then you go, oh, okay, I probably shouldn't keep doing this, and you switch it up. Yeah. Right? So when you, when you uh, uh, left school then, what did you do for work? I um, went into the trade as a plumber. Yep. Yeah, so I did my... Um, I did my full apprenticeship, yep. um, five years, and um, I did it under my dad. My dad was a plumber, so my dad okay. gave me work um, until my apprenticeship. And then when I re- – balancing work and training and then realising I wanted to fight was just so hard. And then when I once I become a licensed plumber, I actually went out and opened my own little business. So 
you know, you're your own boss, right? Yeah. So you work when you want to work. If you need time off to for a fight camp, you can have the time off without yep. any, letting anyone down. Like it was hard because my dad was running a business and, you know, he uh, his way was like he's made his wealth through work, like mm. he, hard work. Like, mm. you know, he's like, this is his way of life is the way that he's done it. And that he was trying to pass that down to us. Yes, but like at the same time, you got to l- – people – are out there to explore i'm young too like mm. yeah you got a successful business going on just that, but like it's not what i want to do i can't I, like in a way like a perfect world for my dad would be me to just leave fighting as a hobby mm. and dedicating everything to my work yeah and you know making a living off that yep but i didn't want to do that and it took me it took me a good like two years going backwards and forward draining myself being unhappy not uh, i wouldn't say extremely unhappy but just mm, this is not what i want to do um you know i need just a bit of time off to do train i want to train for this fight i want mm. to drop the weight like you know try to water load at a bloody um <laughs> on a job, job site. site it's just <laughs> running down where's set, the toilet yeah where's, where's the, the toilet? toilet go to a portaloo <laughs> you don't want to know what's in those portaloos but yeah, so once I realised, um, I think that was the hardest thing was just trying to... I was, I was putting too much effort in to not let my old man down. Mm. I wanted to try to um, keep his expectations of me high, like not making him happy that I'm not letting him down. Mm. But me doing that, I was actually letting myself down mm. without, without me realising. So I was put... In a way, I was putting... Like, selfish, it may sound like I wasn't putting myself first. I was putting everyone else first. Yeah. And then, you know, I took a couple people. Like, there's a guy at my old gym and my old kickboxing coach. I still see him time to time. He's um, Dave Warren and he called him Big Red. And Big Red was this, you know, you got to do what you want to do. Mm. You know, you need to stop doing what everyone else is telling you what to do or making people happy in this sense. And, yeah, well, he when he really spoke to me and it kind of sunk in, I was like, you know what? I don't want to grow old. I don't want to have my um, son or daughter, uh, you know, um, and telling them, you know, oh, yeah, I did I did this. Um, uh, you know, maybe if I did a bit more in it, I could have been here. Mm. I just want to say I put absolutely everything in it, you mm. know, and this is what's come from it. And like what you said, you create more opportunities from mm. it. So, yeah, once I realised that, um, with work-wise, I opened my own business and I did jobs time to time. But when it was fighting, I could focus on fighting, mm. not just – Work and fighting, you know, like we all got to work to make a living, right? But yeah. I could balance it the way I wanted to balance it, not the way someone else wanted me mm. to balance it, you know. So, so how did that conversation go with your dad? Oh, look, it didn't. It was it was pretty um, hard, like, <laughs> and it, it just, I guess, actions just spoke louder than words. Yeah. And we could we could fight and fight word wise, like all the time, this and that, and. You know, and obviously you get upset because you're fighting, you're fighting all the time with your dad, this, mm. that, and you, you're not making. Um, none of us are getting on the same page. Mm. You know, like my old man was like, "You got to be in America to make the USC, this, that. You can't do it in Australia." Blah blah blah, this, that, and you, it get it hurt you every time because they, when you're arguing with someone with words, they'll find a real low point to really like to win the argument in mm. a way. So. I guess the conversations were hard, but when the actions were speaking for themselves, it was just a lot easier. Like, we didn't need to speak about it because it's like, you know, Dad, oh, I need you on a job. No, I'm not. I'm doing, I'm doing my own thing, you know. <laughs> oh, I'm working for this guy. Oh, I'm doing this. And this action started speaking loud. And then it got to a point and um, it got to a point where I just completely – just stop working for him and then like I did bits and pieces here and there yeah but then you could kind of see it slowly creeping back up like you know oh yeah so this is what you need to do this and that like, oh no no no, no. yeah that's kind of like I'll do one day a week here and there with him help him out on jobs that he needed me for yeah yeah and then yeah just the that that's my main thing the actions just spoke louder than the words yeah the words was just too too much and you know you, you gotta remember if your dad's your boss you know, we tried to keep it separate all the time. You know, yeah, but it's very bot- difficult. It's very difficult. And then you go home, yeah. and then you br- and you're still bringing it up. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you know, it's just work. I just want to work, leave the fight, and then this and that, and yeah. But we, I got there in the end. It was a, it was a rocky road. A rocky road. It, it, pretty much everything 
clicked into gear once I got to here. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. So w- w- when you say that, so uh, what what changed when you came here? Well, just being a full time fighter in a way. Um, it was so when we, when we say here, we're talking about Kings, right? Kings. Yeah. yeah. Kings Academy. Yeah. So shout out to Elvis. Elvis, the King of Rock and Roll. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so when I was at, um, my dad was actually doing jiu-jitsu as a hobby at UCA too. Oh, no way. Yeah, so he was always there and we got really close with the coach, Simon, and everything. And because, and then at the time, it's like, dad was in his ear about what I need to do. Like, you know, Daniel thinks he wants to try to do this fight in MMA. Like, you know, I had two fights under them. Mm. Um, two fights under, and then, why, because at the time, no, no disrespect to Simon, he had... He wasn't involved too much in the MMA. He mm. only knew Luke Bazzuti kind of thing. And yeah. he was trying to get fights through Luke Bazzuti all the time. And we couldn't get fights. Like, that was one thing. But, oh, he's a brown belt in jiu-jitsu. Like, that was what I always got told. Oh, because you're a brown belt, that one wants to fight you. Yeah. I was like, all right. No, and, oh, they don't want to fight you at 61. They want to fight you at 66 and this and that. And, like, I had my first two fights, I didn't even do it in my weight category. Yeah. So, um, can I tell you, sometimes it's also promoters playing games. Yeah. Well, so, like, so, so, so I see it from all the different sides. And I'm not saying this to, I'm not putting anybody on the bus. I'm just saying, like, sometimes what happens is, like, you're trying to book a card, so you take fighter nominations, right? So you get all these people, and they're all, like, they're all different weights, they're all different experience. As a promoter, I don't envy their job because, like, you want to try and match people so that it's going to be a competitive fight. Yes. You don't want to match people so that it's like, okay, this boy, this this guy just gets to lay down, you know, um, they're, they're way outmatched or whatever, because nobody wants to see that either. Like, Yes, it might be exciting to see somebody get knocked out or whatever, but it's not good for, for that person continuing in the sport. And if you always match people inadequately, well, those people that just get pumped, a lot of the times they just leave. They don't they don't continue on their journey. Yeah. Whereas if it's a competitive fight and they just lose, it's like, okay, we just need to make some adjustments and, and come back and, and go again, Yeah, right? And so as a promoter, like you've got this sort of like this responsibility to try and um, make it work for both fighters, you know, you want it to be competitive for both of them. And then what happens is that, you know, as you get closer and closer to fight day, people either get nervous, they get injured. Um, so many different things happen, right? Um, and injuries are the, are, the, are, the, are the worst one because especially uh, in the amateur ranks, like guys are, um, they feel like, oh, I've got a fight booked. I need to train harder. Whereas you're not going to change much in the last, say, four weeks, Right, that's the reality. You, everything that you've learned, like you, you, you can do some strategy things, and you can obviously work on your cardio. You can do bits and pieces, but you aren't going to actually improve your level of skill dramatically in four weeks by going any harder than what you've already been doing. One hundred percent. Yeah. Right. But then you know, like I've learned that the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> so people get caught up in this, right? And then so you know, like guys, when I hear of like people getting injured, um, the week before fight week, it's like, what are you doing? Yeah. Like this is part of, like you. What are you changing? Part of your, yeah, <laughs> part of your camp should be including that deload of the last week. Yeah. You know, um, uh, so, you know, whenever I, I know people that are fighting, you know, in the, I ask them how long and if it's a week away, I go, okay, or two weeks away, be very specific with your training partners. Like pick who you're going to go with. Go with people that you know are going to be safe on you because you don't need hard work, like the, the hard work uh, or hard rolls or hard this at that hard point in time. Been done. You've already done it. Yeah. Right? If you're going to hard spar, that should have been four weeks out, you 100%. know, five weeks out. So you've got time to recover. Yeah. And um, so people get injured. And then, so then the promoter's going, oh, shit, what do I do? And it's like, okay, so they've matched all these fights. And then it's like, okay, this person at 70 kilos has been injured. Okay. We don't really have anybody else at 70. Okay. We'll ask the guy that's at 66, does he want to fight at 70? Yeah. Right? And that's what happens all the time. And then the thing is, though, the guy that's fighting at 70 probably weighs like 75. Yeah, exactly right. right? Yeah. So then it's like, okay, I've got this guy who's weighing 75. I'm trying to match him to this guy who fights at 66. Let's say he's 70, right? Can we do a catch weight? I don't know. They, they, they try and work on some of these things, but it becomes very, very difficult. And then it's like, okay, now, now you got to throw in, there might be a skill differential here or this or that, right? And so then it, that, that's where it all just goes astray. And sometimes you get like major mismatches or people just, that just don't want to take fights because they're like, oh, it's last minute upper weight this that and rightfully so right like at the end of the day you got to think about it as an individual um what's going to benefit your career the most yeah right yeah well see at the time like that's what i was saying like it was such for me it was a massive learning like trying to learn how to do this in a way like um for like where i was uca it was like only they only trained twice a week Mm. and um it was just mainly jujitsu right Mm. so i was doing all my own other trainings at boxing gyms muay thai gyms and 
privates, this, that. Mm. And um, because um, I felt like I needed to do more and and as um, Simon Farns was, he wasn't um, just a jiu-jitsu coach. He wasn't in the MMA scene. He mm. was a mechanic by trade and, yep. you know, so – I was doing all my self-promotion. I was, like, reaching out to all the promoters, this, that. I was trying to – I was doing it all myself. And, um, like, I, Simon got me two fights, yes, but just – I felt like at that, Simon always wanted more out of me. Mm. And where, where, where I was, I, ha- I didn't know how to show him that. And I would put everything into training all the time. He just And it's like – in a way, it was kind of hinting like I'm not ready to do this, this and that. I've got to do this. I've got to be training every day of the week. I, c- I can't be out being a plumber and working. I can't, you mm. know, I can't have a girlfriend. Like, just stuff like that. It was just, um, it was starting to get too much. But at the time, too, his son was um, getting into motorbike riding and he was very good at it. Mm. And fair enough, family comes first. Yeah. Um, and he rightly, he respected when I kept hassling. I was, I was like that little... Um, Annoying puppy that always wanted to pat, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. come on, give me a fight. Why, why, why can't What's you give next? me a fight? Look, look at all these fight promotions coming up. Like, <laughs> who are you talking to? Are you talking to anyone? Like, I just felt like I was not getting ripped off, but I was doing so much training for this stuff yeah. and just getting told I can't do it, this, that. And, you know, dad, even my old man was like in the year because Simon and him were good friends. And it's like, that's getting to a point. I'm like, oh my God, I've had two fights, you know, I've first, both guys were from, um, the same gym but I like you know i got i had a decision loss and then i've won one like you know this is why well, can't i get a fight like you know i'm in the game now like everyone knows kind of who i am mm. i've had these 10 pancreation fights and went undefeated it's why 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 everything was a big why and then because i was so loyal to i didn't try to explore any mm. other gyms i wanted to do it like my dream was like you know i'll do it with the coach that i started with mm. right um but yeah then just Got to a point where I got sat down by the coaching staff and they just said, you know, I can't... They've said, we can't provide you what you want to try to do, you know. Mm. You either... We can keep doing it the way we're doing it or if you want to take it to the next level, you need to, like, take it to the next level. You need to go be training every day. You need to find people, like... And then it was... I don't know. It was It was a bit hard. It was... It, take it how you want it. It was just... It's so hard to explain, like, it's pretty much just saying I couldn't do it in a way. Yeah. But to me, what I got out of it is, like, you can't do it. I can't be there. Uh, we can't do it, mm. you know? Like, he's everything. He knows me back to front, and I just felt like, oh, it was a big stab in the back. And then it was just, I was outside of the gym, and then that's when um, Big big Red, like, the Dave was saying, come up to me. He's like, hey, what do you want to do? Do you want to fight? It's like, oh, I do, but apparently I can't. I'm not, I can't fight this not ready for it this and that or something it's like you do what you want to do and then <laughs> as he kept saying that to me and then he took me under his wing so he he had like a little gym set up in his garage and yeah i was just training with him all the time and then we i got myself a fight like i was saying and i i, like, I had a little help with sponsorships getting me out there too um but all myself just exhausting myself trying to get into the game mm. um even with two fights under my belt and, yeah, I got myself a fight. Um, and, yeah, Dave got all his um, combat license and everything to corner me. I had another guy um, at the time, Mike. I had Ara and Rob and Benny. They were um, part of my gym. And we end up going into the garage too and just doing extra training. And then, yeah, like I tried to, you know, include people from the gym, like Simon, like, you know, you want to come and this and that. And, yeah, I guess when he couldn't be there, I realised, okay, it's, it's just Dave and I at the moment. Mm. And then, yeah, then one time Dave just, well, we won that fight. We won that fight. Um, we kept training. Like, my 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 theory is you always stay ready. Yeah. Right? Just stay ready. And we're training again. And then he saw something on his phone. He's like, oh, Elvis is inviting an open sparring day at Kings for Saturday. Do you mm. want to go down? Yep. I was like, yeah. And he's like, I think you got to go down. Let's go down. We went yeah. there. We sparred, you know, met Brian, um, Brian Eversol. And I remember I knew – Brian already knew who I was because I was that – like I said, the puppy just wanted to pat – I was messaging him, get me a fight on XFC, get me a fight, get me a fight because yeah. I knew he was the one matchmaking everyone. Yeah. And everyone would always wheel me in but not get – I wouldn't get anything out of it. I'm like, am I training for a fight? Like, you know, and <laughs> and mind you, I'm still um, – 
don't know <coughs> much about anything like yeah. what I need to do for training, the weight cutting, this, that. Like I'm just just explore like just yeah, trying, I learned, to, trying I to learn it as you go. Yeah. yeah, I learned it as I was going. Like and um yeah, and then I finally um my co um Dave at the time, Big Red, just said Well, after the second sparring here, he's like, This is where you gotta be. You gotta be here and then Dave spoke to Elvis and Brian and said, you know, can Daniel come here to train full time now? Like, mm. can we do it? And yeah, we had to start training here. I get a fight again um, in Melbourne, won that fight. And then I get a title fight and it's like, cool. And I even like, still was going back to um, UCA just to show my face, like stay loyal. Mm. And um, yeah, title fight come and yeah, they, they couldn't be there. Um, Brian cornered me for the title fight yeah. and then, um, yeah, won my title fight and then yeah. come back to the gym and then, like, you know, I get told, like, oh, we could have done that. Yeah. I was like, okay, you pretty much told me you couldn't do mm. it. You, you pushed me away in a way. But yeah. so that's where that's where that – it was just a massive learning curve. So I think I had five fights before my title fight. But, yeah, yeah that – like, I probably jumped a couple pages there because it's a long story. Yeah. But, yeah, so that's what brought me here. It was just a bit of, like <laughs> – Oh, actually, that time when I was, at, when I told you Big like Big Red, Dave came up to me, it was like, I didn't know, like, that was me, I, to me, I was like, oh, I'm just going to go work and just train, like, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, I don't think this is for me, I'm, like, I was, get, I didn't think that, the age was bothering me at the time, I'm like, mm. I'm like, you know, I'm 21, 22 now, like, I should be, you know, have like 10 fights under my belt, like, I thought age was a thing at the time, like, yeah. but I realised, realising, like, some of these guys aren't even peak into their 30, Yeah. But, Absolutely. Um, I just thought, you know, it's all over in a way. Yeah. But then I come back and it's like a new path is open and it's a, it's a new game again. I felt like a I felt like a little kid again going redoing it all. Yeah. And now, yeah, just it's, going hard. It, it's one of those things, uh, you know, loyalty is a very interesting concept because everybody, when you say, would you like somebody to be loyal? Yeah, like they'd say, yeah, let, that's a great trait to have. Yeah. But you, you almost forget that loyalty is a two-way street, you know, uh, loyalty doesn't just mean that, you know, you follow the leader, you know, they want to go off a cliff, you go off a cliff. Yes, okay, in one sense you could say that's loyalty. But if the leader is loyal as well, the leader is also looking at what is the best thing for my student? Or what is the best thing for this person? Because, um, you know, when I, when I, if I'm trying to be loyal to my friends, that's what I'd be looking for is what is the best thing for you, you yeah. know? Not what's the best thing for me because that's not really being loyal, that's being selfish. Yes. Right? And... Uh, uh, Liam actually, uh, Liam Reznikov from VT1, he actually put it in a really good way, is that, you know, uh, a lot of places, they have to really think about what it, is that they, what it is that their gym is good at or what it is that their training facility is good at. You know, uh, there's, there are coaches that are good at uh, taking a fighter from scratch to the amateur ranks. There are coaches that are good at taking uh, from amateurs to pros and then there are pro coaches that just focus heavily on pros, right? Now, <clears throat> each of them have their... Uh, pros and cons, right? Like people would say, oh, I'd love to go and train at the place with the pros, right? The place with the pros, okay, for, for that coach, it's a very different dedication that they need to apply because uh, they're not focused on the beginner. Where does majority of the mon money come from? It comes from the casuals. Doesn't like, you know, the, exactly. the people that fight are the one percenters. The people that train and pay your, your weekly membership fees are the hobbies, the yes. guys that come in day in, day out. So if you're focusing so heavily on the pros, chances are you probably don't have as many hobbyists to pay the bills, Yep. So it becomes a very different business in terms of what you're running. Now you're, now you're trying to operate a gym that basically takes a you know, percentage of the fighters' winnings uh, if you're in that pro game, right? Or there's the, the coaches that focus on that, yeah, trying to uh, take amateur fighters to that pro level um, where it's like, yeah, yeah, amateur fighters, they still pay their memberships and that's where you're, you're making your money from and you focus on trying to get people into those ranks and then you've got the, the gyms that focus on self-defence, so to speak. Yes. You know, and the hobbyists and the guys that just, you know, want to go through and get the training in or get the ranking and, and uh, learn something, but they don't want to compete. Yes. Right? So there's, and, and when I say that, there's no right or wrong. It's just, where do your interests lie? And do those interests that your uh, coaches have, do they align with the goals that you have as the student? Yeah. Right? And there's nothing wrong. And I, I think any, like I'm, for me, I'm very open in terms of, you know, I train at three different places. Um, I go, I'd go anywhere to train, really. Um, yeah. Of course, you know, I, I have my three places that I go to because I enjoy the training there and they're convenient and local to where I am. Um, and so that's why, you know, I, I train there. But obviously, any time I can get out and like, you know, I came and trained with you before, um, I'll, I'll go out and, and train wherever I can train. Yeah. Because I think... Um, 
I was stuck in this very, uh, you know, that yeah, this, a similar, a very similar thing to you because when I first competed, I was uh, training kung fu at the time, and I was in this kung fu school very much like you, you know, organizing my own fights, organizing my own comps, doing everything myself, and um, you know, didn't really have the support of my master. Right? Yeah. Like you know, he didn't even come to my fights. Yeah. Right. Well, that's yeah, that's the same ball game as me. Sa- yeah. Same same thing, right? So then. You know, it's interesting because, you know, for me, it, how it came to a head was like I sort of um, came to a bit of an ultimatum where it was like, okay, um, if you want to train outside, that's fine, but you can't train here anymore. And so I was like, oh, okay. So it's like, you know, this place that had been my home for 20 odd years, um, you're basically saying, I can't come home if I want to go and travel. Yeah. Right? It's, that's the analogy that I'd use. So I want to go and explore other countries and go to all these different places around the world. But I can't, I can't live in this house if I have, if I want to go and have holidays and go and explore. Yeah. Right. So then I was like, okay, well, look, that's you know, as much as it pains me, I've got to go. Like, yeah. you know, it's that's the way it's got to go, right? It's the same thing. I, 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 it really resonates for me when you're telling that story because, you know, you you probably went through a very similar thing to me. It's like, you want to stay with this place, but the goals no longer align. That's exactly right. Yeah. Right? No. Hundred percent spot on. Yeah. So the, the vision is different, right? And so one of the things that I, I, I'm always very big on whenever I um, look at, you know, how people are, uh, like, different schools and, and how they train and things like that, I always think about, okay, what is the vision of this coach? You know, is he teaching for people to get good at, at a sport? Is he teaching for health and culture? Is he teaching for self-defense? Like, there's all these different um, goals, right? Uh, there is no place that's going to be able to do uh, necessarily everything effectively because if you're focusing on heavily on competition, well, you're going to neglect some of the aspects that, you know, the hobbyist probably doesn't want to grind that hard. Yeah. Right? And likewise, if you're focusing purely on the hobbyist, well, the the competition-driven person isn't going to get the support that they need to go and compete at the level that they want. Right? Yeah. So so this is where it's like, you know, the, the question always comes down to, okay, for you as the, the student or the, 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 the person competing, what is your goal? And... Does that align with the place that you're training at? Or does that, al- and, and it's not to say like, because a- everywhere that you train could probably have different coaches too. And each of those coaches have a different focus. So then you've got to go, okay, which of the coaches are the ones that more align with the goals that I'm trying to chase? And I think you found that, you know, yeah, with Brian and, and the guys here, you know, having Brian in the corner and, you know, even like, I think at the last showdown, I was talking to Brian and Brian was like, yeah, I've got like, you know, eight, nine people fighting, got to wrap eight, nine pairs of hands. And <laughs> he was like, oh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just nonstop hand wrapping. He loves it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's exactly right. Like when I found Brian, like, like when I was watching, like when I met Brian and seen his students and I'm like, like they're all joking around with him, laughing. And I'm like this nervous, like I feel like a nervous little kid again. I'm like, yeah. this guy's done what I want to do. Like this guy's been in the USC. This yeah. guy's like, look his name up. He's the first thing that pops up. You yeah. know what I mean? I'm like, Oh, like I look, I was, I actually looked up to Brian, and like, yeah. and I was like, I just felt like a little fanboy, <laughs> you know. And it took, and like Brian, like even Brian shaved the chest hair into an arrow. <laughs> <laughs> if I could grow it, <laughs> but yeah, no. When I realized, and I knew who Elvis was yeah. because um, Elvis came from the same gym as my my coach did at the yep. time, and then um, yeah, Elvis has been there. He's been the USA, like yep. he's in it, and I was like, that was another. Like, and he's they invited me with open arms, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, and then, yeah, Brian, like, was, wow, like, this is like, he, if I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it with this guy, like, yeah. and like, yeah, I've been like, I feel like in Australian MMA to to advance, you don't, you do have to explore a little bit, mm. yeah. And I have been to gym to gym, like, I've um. Like Voganos, he's been a great um, motivator for me watching mm. his process, and I got invited down to their gym to spar and been sparring at Freestyle MMA. Like, yep. ha- thanks for Freestyle MMA. Hey, for every shout out to the boys there, Joe. Yeah, yeah. Um, Joe Lazpaz let me spar there, and um, yeah, just but like this is like home now. Like mm. this is where everything branched off. Like, mm. like where I was was in a cage that never opened up. Now here, I'm in a. I'm on a tree that keeps growing branches. Like I'm yeah. learning people, meeting fighters, meeting USC fighters, this, that. It's like, yes, this is like, I feel great now. Like, and a big um, thing that my big day, big red said, a happy fighter is a good fighter. Yeah. Is as long as you're happy, yeah. you're a good fighter. And yep. it's always sunk in with me. Like I always tell these, like some of the boys that are struggling in camps in their weight cuts or whatever, you know, I'm like, I get one, one, one person told me, a happy fighter is a good fight. If you're not happy, you're, 
like as a mate, I would not want you to go in the cage. You've got to be happy. You yeah. know. You, you know, know that that, that what you're doing. That applies to anything in life. Exactly right. Right. You know, the amount of people that um, have a job and they go to work and they bring, like, they might have an unhappy ha- home life, and they bring that into work and it makes them a miserable work colleague to yeah. be around with or a horrible boss. You know, for me, when I was uh, in in business and running businesses, you know, one of the things that I was always very conscious of was. Uh, how happy my employees are and I don't mean that just purely from is my workplace a good work work environment for them them to work at like what are their personal goals what are they trying to achieve in their life because at the end of the day if you're if you feel like you're at work and you're sacrificing some some personal goal to reach to to just be at work you're not going to be happy at work right so yeah you have to be able to do everything uh, you know and I I sort of received the 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 counter advice when I was um uh, when I first started working and it was basically, you know, the advice that I'd gotten was, uh, you know, um, my boss at the time was very successful and he said, look, you know, I, I could have been a, um, a world-class PGA golfer, um, but I gave up golf to focus on business. Now I play golf whenever I want. Yeah. Right. And that, that was the pathway that he chose. And at the time, because I looked up to him so much, I thought, oh, you know, he's probably right. I probably can't, you know, and be so invested in martial arts if I want to be good and successful in the automotive industry. Yeah. Right. When I actually reflect back on that now, I think, you know, oh, that was actually some detrimental advice because the world's a very different place now. Yes. Right? Because back then, it's like the freedom of information was very different to how we have it now. Now it's like, okay, if you're keen to learn, you can learn almost any skill that you want just from Googling or, or typing it into YouTube and go, how to do this. 100%. And you've got like these people that will show you how to do this in step-by-step guides. You know, people use it for, for jujitsu problem solving. Oh, how do I get out of this? And yep. then type, in, type it in. As long as you know the right words to use, you can find, you know, that position exactly or that submission. For. Exactly what yeah. you're looking for. So I feel like, you know... Um, the world is very different now where you can actually pursue uh, more than one thing provided you have your priorities in order, right? Yep. When I say that, it's like, okay, you've only got 24 hours in the day, right? So if you go and have to dedicate 15 hours to one thing and you need to sleep for eight hours, you don't really have much time to do anything else. Whereas if, you know, um, for you to be su- su- successful at work only requires you to do your eight hours and you can spend your other six training and then you go to bed, well... You don't have any time for anything else. That's exactly right. But if that's what you want to do, you could be successful at both. Yes. Right? But then it, it, got, it gets more screwy then when it goes, okay, you want to have a successful relationship, successful family, a successful whatever else. You go, okay, how do I now fit all of these things in? Something's got to go. Getting the right balance. <laughs> yeah. Brian and I talk about this. Yeah. yeah it's, it's so hard. Yeah. Having the right balance. And, and like I said, me coming here, I've worked out the right balance too. Mm. And I'm being like... Probably the last year, I had a lot go on last year, but the last year was definitely probably one of the happiest times because everything was just balanced. Like, you know, I got my partner, Taylor. Mm. Um, I, got, I got two dogs. I bought, I bought a house with her. <laughs> like, it's just everything I've balanced it right now in the way that I can be happy. I still get the training in and still focus on the my end goal. Well, I shouldn't say the end goal, but the goal that I want yeah. to achieve. Yeah, and you got to yeah. just enjoy the process as well. Exactly right, yeah. Of course, there's going to be... Road Ups bumps. There's no high. There's no straight highway. Like yeah. you know what I mean. Like there's gonna be road bumps. There's gonna be a curve. You know. Yeah. Everything's gonna try slow you down, but it's the way you take it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And I think a positive mind, positive thinking, is always a very, very strong attribute. Just to keep, mm. keep you, keep you going through what you want to do. Mm. You know. There's just been a lot of setbacks. Like, you know, I had six fights last year, and you know that was with the middle of COVID. Mm. I, I had a I was renting a house that had a mold damage and I was moving <sighs> houses and I moved back with my parents. I moved back with my partner's parents and then we and I was looking at houses if I was gonna rent again and I bought a house. But in the same time I had six fights. Mm. I I wish, wish I had seven, but I had to pull out of one fight because I nearly reconstructed my whole shoulder. Mm. But um but that's just like another upset, right? Mm. You just it's the way you go about it. Like I could, you know, or you know, but I did the things that the doctors told me to do and re- rehab my shoulder. At the time, I got to catch up on a lot of other things, you know, mm. and I started renovating my house and it worked. everything happens for a reason, I feel, mm. you know. Like, I didn't want – I wanted to have this out, another fight and then, you know, shoulder went and it gave me more opportunity to ju- – I just bought a house, so it gave me more opportunity to spend time um, getting used to living into a new home with mm. my partner, you know, and – and I, you know, love her to death. Like it, 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 she's supported me no matter what situation mm. we've been in, and um, she supports the fighting. Like she, she just knows 
She goes, I just see how disciplined you are. And yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, you need somebody like that. You, you yeah. know, um, there's a saying, you know, behind every great man is a great woman. I know yeah. that's probably sounds sexist or you know, discriminatory <laughs> in today's world, but I stand by it. And, you know, there's another part of the saying which goes behind every failed man, there's two. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but um, there's, there was something else that I, I wanted to pick up on that you mentioned about, um, you know, uh, feeling like – uh, you were in a caged environment, and now you you sort of branched onto all these trees. You know, I always talk about this idea, and I think it's a really good good co- good concept. Is that to learn any skill, you need to have structure, right? So to learn jujitsu, you can't learn jujitsu until you learn the positions. Yes, right. And then once you know the positions, now it's like, how do I move between those positions, the transitions? Um, and then you know, but in in relation to I guess the analogy that you you were using there, it's like sometimes yeah, like. When there's a structure, it's going to allow you to, to develop really, really quickly. But it's like, you know, being that, that fish in that fish tank, that if the fish tank never gets bigger, the fish can never grow either. Right? Exactly right. At some point, that structure becomes a cage. So there's a real sort of uh, tipping point, you know, like I always think, you know, I, I've done the thought experiment both ways. Like, let's say there was no structure and it was complete anarchy. Well, the problem is, is that, yeah, you don't, you won't have any uh, growth and development because you don't have structured learning. Yeah. But if that structure is too rigid, it becomes a cage and you don't have any freedom and restriction to actually think outside the box. So, you know, um, I, I think it's good from that perspective that you, you manage to uh, switch out the cage and, and, and basically find yourself a bigger environment that you can now grow further into. Yes. Um, sort of pull it, uh, channeling on that, you know, when it come to, came to finding sponsors and doing that side of things, how did that all come about? Like, was that all things that you were grinding or is this things that you've had help with? Like, how, how, how have you sort of... Um, manage that process i did it all myself grinding um just things that i was involved with you know like people in my life like you know blacktown tattoo that did all the tattoos and when and they, they helped me i was when i really wanted to get out of plumbing at the time with the whole you know dad thing i tried to learn the tattoo artist then they helped me do that um oh so you actually learned how to do tattoo oh yeah i was an apprentice yeah no way. yeah for a bit but um obviously when i realized you know Try and don't juggle too many balls. You got to juggle the right balls, right? Yeah. And, um, but yeah, like that was another sponsorship that just was a given. Just being being close with them, you know, they wanted to sponsor me. And then um, Cooks Plumbing was been part of my my dad for thirty years, thirty odd years. They've been so close, and they're like, yeah, we'll sponsor you. Yeah. You know, and then the guys that cut my hair, they they jumped on board, and that that was just word of mouth at the moment. Yeah. Well. yeah. But now, like. We're, because we're pretty deep in, I'm pretty deep in the sport now, right? So, and I'm, you know, there's pros, you know, I want to be in the USC or I want to be in a promotion that people are going to know the name, Daniel DeStorm Mitchell, right? Yeah. And I'm, I, I, like, I, the goal still hasn't changed. Mm. And with having a partner um, that is trusted in my goal, like, she trusts everything I do mm. and she supports everything I do, she said, like, like Brian always says, you just focus on the training and winning fights. Mm. And she's up the same page as that now. She's like, you just focus on training and winning fights. I'll control your social. I'll put out the sponsorships. So in a way, she's like a man. She's managing my um, my sport now. Like, yeah. And self managing, it's it's just, it's hard. Yeah. Like you know, you need a lot of time, I guess. And you know, it's not like what you said. There's only twenty four hours in a day, right? Yeah. And I still work. I still work on the tools and. You know, it's so hard to, like, put myself out there. Like, I haven't even done anything for this year yet, and I've got, like, IMAF in a month, you yeah. know. So it's just one of those things. It's, it's so hard to do it yourself, but when you have people that help and support you, mm. um, it just makes it that so much easier and less stress. And yeah. that's, that's what you want to be. Like, I don't want to be worried, like, oh, you know, is my hairdresser sponsoring me? Or yeah. is, should, I get, should I go back to um, that real estate company that was b- sponsoring me, like, this and that? It's like, no, I just need to worry about rocking up to wrestling class at 6 p.m., you know yeah. what I mean? I, don't, I shouldn't have to be worried about other, other things like that. Like, let yeah. the fighting talk, like, let the fighting do the talking, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but having, like, Taylor, my girlfriend, like, she, she presents them. And just makes it easier, and like she will accept it. And all I have to do, you know, is sign the little contract that we make yeah. up for. Yeah, but yeah. The sponsors has always helped. So, well, it's, I think it's a, uh, it's one of those things. It's really hard to like put yourself out there and sell yourself, like, yeah. Because you sort of, you sort of also, I think everybody always, you know, and I, I do this too, right? Like, you don't really think about uh, what kind of a reach 
and all that sort of stuff that you that you necessarily offer. And this is why it creates a a market for agents, so to speak, or like these you know uh, people that manage that manage you and help you to find these sponsorship opportunities and we'll do the negotiation and sort of, they, they do the selling for you. Yeah. Because when you're selling yourself, you sort of sound a bit like facetious. Like you're like, ah, oh, like you're big noting yourself. Like, oh, I'm, I'm this and I'm that. And you, try and you know, and you feel a bit awkward about it. Awkward, yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I that completely resonates for me because yeah, I don't like doing that either. And yeah. that's part of the reason I was telling Daniel before the podcast, like I don't really have a monetization strategy for this because I never started for that purpose. And I yeah. feel weird to go and, talk to people and be like hey you know you want to sponsor my podcast for for an ad read or something like that like it just doesn't sit well whereas you know um i suppose you know if i if i if, if i had somebody that was going out and getting that business for me and all i had to do was the ad read it'd be a lot easier like i wouldn't have, i wouldn't think about it i'd be just like okay yeah just read this and money 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 comes in right like That's you exactly just sort right. of think about it like that yeah but um it's important to have good people around you that that will help and also uh look out for the right way you know that things should be done yeah. because the problem is is that there's a lot of people out there that will do it opportunistically yeah. right like you know especially when people start to they, they start to get to that point of getting close to breaking out you get all these people reaching out to you and saying oh you know um we'd love to do this with you and do that with you or let me manage this or let me manage that but you don't really know does this person have really have my best interest at heart or they're just looking at it from the dollar figure perspective and they're going, okay, I've got an opportunity here to, to skim 10% off whatever I can, whatever contract I can secure for you, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> let's now talk a little bit about IMAF. Yes. Okay. So, the road to IMAF, you had to do, uh, you did, did you do, you did the Oceania, oh, wait. Yeah, I did Which the Oceania. Oceania. Yeah. But I also did the Worlds before the Oceanas too. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've already done one Worlds. Yeah. Okay. So, what, what happened at previous Worlds? So, previous Worlds, I fought at Featherweight. Yep. Um, and... I won my first fight, mm -hmm. um, and then the second fight I lost to the uh, the world champ. Oh. So he he actually went out and took it, but we did lose on a decision. Yeah, but um, just the way I went about with the weight cut and everything for that, because um, IMAF is like a jujitsu comp. You weigh in on the same day you fight, right? Yep. Um, but yeah, that was or well, one the experience was like unbelievable. Like I I wish I um took the experience a little bit better. Like I. The Oceania was a different story, but like I'm just I'm overseas in Abu Dhabi representing Australia, like in like in the Olympics for MMA kind mm. of thing, right? But um, yeah, but um, I think the weight cut went too well mm -hmm. because I was weighing in at like 63 kilos, and I was versing guys at 66, and yep. like what you said, like even in jiu-jitsu cons, people can still do that, you know, two kilo weight loss before. So I was the lighter guy, mm. but I wouldn't, that's no excuse. Like to me, weight's never been a problem about yeah. it. It shouldn't never when be When you're an close excuse. enough, it's not too much of an excuse. Yeah. I so said to me, it's not an excuse, but it was just an experience, but I feel like the experience did get to me a little bit, which mm. like I was saying before is learning, you know, that it's just the same that you do every day. Mm. Right. And, um, I think I just, the hype a little bit got too much for me and not too much, but, um, like I said, there's no excuse of the win and the loss. Like, you know, just it's a learning everything was a learning experience. Come back, um, wanted to fight straight away, I was like, Oh yeah, we want you for the Oceanas. Hmm. Um at the time I was um nutritionist was sponsoring me and he did all my nutrition. I told him I want to do it at way. He's like, Oh yeah, well me's mate, man anyway. You mate you waiting at sixty three. Yeah. Um but this is the same day. Like nine times I mean, every time I'm gonna be fighting at band and weight now, that's the goal, is to be the band and weight. Yep. Um but Obviously, in IMAF, we look at different strategies because we got to be... Multiple days. Yeah, multiple days, same weight. And anyway, Oceana's come, weight cut was a breeze again, got down to just like 60 kilos walking around, it was perfect. And, but I went there and I just felt great. Like, I just wanted to be there. I couldn't wait to fight. Yeah. You know, I had my first fight against a New Zealand guy. Um, we went to a decision, but like, um, he was a very, very good kickboxer and I out-kickboxed a kickboxer. Like, yeah. You know, when... Really, I should have taken him down, submitted him, but yeah. I was having so much fun. Like, I just, that fight to me is one of the highlights of my career so far. I was just having so much fun. And I don't even remember when it happened, but I, it could have been a head clash, but I actually had um, a bad split in my eye Ugh. in the fight. Yeah. But, you know, we got, the, we got the win, and then I had to back it up the next day and fight. And again, <laughs> super, super keen still. I versed um, a French Polynesian guy. Um, 
who trains out of City Kickboxing. Mm. Um, he's got a scholarship there, or I don't know. I can't remember the story, but yeah. And um, he gave me a really tough fight, but mm. I just remember how sore I was after having a back, like a back to back fight. He yeah. had the bye. Yeah. I was like, oh, like this is something. Different. And like that first round was a little bit of um, swimming against a very strong tide. Yeah. And um, he put it on strong. Yeah, he was just super strong. Like yeah. he grabbed me, and I was like, Fuck. and yeah. I just didn't feel like I didn't have anything in yeah. me. Tired from but that. Day yeah, yeah. But then the sec- second round, I was like, ah, right, we kicked it in, grabbed his back, had back his whole round, and yeah, yeah then. The Third, so I probably lost, definitely lost the first round, but the second and third to come back and to get the win. But that's when I really that IMAF is everything that I train. Oh, I've trained so hard for that Oceana, mm. like the fir- the worlds too. I think COVID was a big play. Like the gym got shut down, COVID yeah. was going around. I was doing my own training, like yeah. I was doing like nearly um two hour walks, like for my weight cuts and stuff <laughs> like that. Just, just, just um not. Like, I think I guess I didn't feel like I trained enough for it. Yeah. Like, like I always say, I was, I'm always ready, but but that was the first world. But then the Oceanians, like, I, everything trained absolutely like a demon. Like, I knew I'd put the work in. Like, I was like, I'm not coming here for second place. Like, I've put too much work in for this. And I just trusted in my ability. And um, and then that's when it kind of sunk to me that I was like, Holy, I, I'm doing – the lifetime, I mean, the one goal that I had as a kid that I used to tell my mother all the time yep. is represent Australia in the sport. Yep. And I'm representing Australia. It? Yeah, I'm doing it. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, got really good wins out of that and then come straight back to another fight for a title fight, won that. And then and then I had another fight booked straight after that. And yeah. then I uh, did your shoulder. Did my shoulder. But yeah, then I got presented with this opportunity again because um, I've, I've had 10 fights now. Um, and, you know, we're looking to see if we can grab a nice pro Fight. start. Yeah, yep. pro and start working on that. But this come up again, um, Welds in Serbia and, you know, Daniel, you want to do it then and wait? So let's do it. You yep. know, let's – like the, One last the, hurrah, right, for, for, yeah. the, for, for the Emmys and then uh, – Well, the, the confidence I'm feeling and everything just in how – just everything that's been going, like just being happy again for starters, like being happy, just, you know, not letting pressure get to you, like – um, one of my camps was a little bit, oh, and like, but you got to remember, camps like a roller coaster. So yeah. You're not gonna feel, you're not meant to feel like this the whole time. Yeah. Like that's that's one thing I try to tell people that are going through it. Like, as in you're not gonna have a high all the time. Yeah. So, yeah. Now and when you get there, it's important. You just gotta you gotta soak in the atmosphere. Yeah. You know, I, I think too many people are so fixated. Um, they're, they're fixated on on the outcome that they want. They're not worried and like thinking enough about the inputs. Yeah. You know, I'm a very big. Uh, I'm very big on smells. Like for some reason, I just you know, to, whenever you walk into a place, like there's a distinct smell. You yeah. Know? Whether it's KFC or the hospital or the shopping center, like this particular spe- smells, and they help you to remember things. And uh, for me, it's like the smell of the gloves. It's like you smell the gloves. The it's leather. Like, oh, yeah. Violence. Like it's beautiful, you know. And then the the sights, the sounds, the like. It's an experience that you know, it's it's your experience. It's one that you only you'll remember for the rest of your life. Yeah. So. Why wouldn't you try and absorb all of those things in the moment? Exactly you know, just right. Just enjoy it and uh, really have fun with it. And yeah, like the, uh, you know, for anyone that um, has never competed in the cage, it's like it's one of the most free things that you can do. You know, when else can you like knee people? You know, punch them, kick them, submit them, like everything. It's like it, it, there's there's this freedom that comes along with it that unless you 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 really you know engaging in a lot of street fighting and <laughs> yeah. you know um, like. Violence, doing the wrong thing. Doing yeah. the wrong thing. There's no other way to sort of find that same sort of adrenaline rush. Yeah, hundred percent, man. And I feel I maybe lacked that in the first worlds. Yeah. And I didn't take it for granted. Like I couldn't believe what I was doing. But yeah. I kind of treated it more like oh, I've never really been overseas. Like I went to Japan for ADCC one time when I was young. But other than that, I was like, cool, I'm overseas. You know what I mean? Like yeah. Now, like I just know. Oh, it's, <laughs> I'm hungry for it. Like, like I want enjoy that. Enjoy the plane ride. Enjoy, yeah. You know, all of these little steps along the way. Yeah. And Oceana's was the best thing for that. This feeling the moment. Like even though it was in Australia, in Queensland, but yeah. it still felt like I went there and I just felt great. Like, you know, I had my partner with me, everyone yeah. around me. I had good people around me. Just, 
it was good. And my partner's actually coming to this one, and she reckons. Oh, nice. Yeah, she reckons. Um, she I haven't lost in front of her yet, so she's like she's a good lucky charm. Apparently so. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. All yeah, right. we, will. we will. We'll we'll bring home the gold. I'm feeling com- I'm feeling confident. The main thing is to feel good and confident about yourself. Like I feel confident in my ability. Yeah. I give you. People have a bad day at sparring class and they feel like, oh, you know, I'm not ready. You know, I got yeah. taken down. Like, I shouldn't have been taken down. Mate, it's just th- sparring. That's what sparring is. You're learning. Like, you, you're, and plus, a lot of people lose their way in sparring, I feel, because they always go back to their old ways. Mm. In sparring, you're meant to try the things that yeah. you've been working on. That's it. Yeah. So. Well, there's, there's always this little, uh, you know, I call it the little devil that's uh, trying to talk you out of things. Yes. You know, and he, like, that's the, this part of your ego that is so concerned with how other people view you or, uh, you know, how bad, or like, it, it's basically trying to pull on anything negative that you've got to make you do nothing. Like, yep. the devil's not going to be happy. Like, the, the demon, this little demon inside of you isn't going to be happy if you do nothing. It's going to be like, oh, you, you should feel guilty. You're doing nothing. You're just sitting on the couch, you little fat, you know, whatever. <laughs> right? But then you do you try and do things, and it's like oh you shouldn't do that, you yeah know, you shouldn't be competing oh you should be scared <laughs> I <know>? can't <laughs> like, yeah like you know oh you're not ready for this like you know all of these things that it's it's there talking to you trying trying to find a way out, but then even if you found the way out you still wouldn't be happy exactly right right yeah. so so it's like you you just got to almost put that to the side and you got to also remember that whatever you're feeling in that fight camp or in that or, or in that moment you know your opponent's feeling it too mm-hmm. you know you go into a fight you're tired okay the other guy's tired too. Yep. The question is, who's who's more tired? Who's more tired, right? yeah. You know, you get your hands wrapped and you go, ah, oh, yes, I feel like I could punch through walls. <laughs> it's like, yeah, but your opponent could too. <laughs> yeah, right? that's exactly right, yeah. <laughs> so it's like, okay, be smart, you know? like you gotta That's where the mental side comes, yeah. Yeah. That's how you just got to be happy, take the moment in. That's it, yeah. enjoy it, smile. Exactly right, yeah. yeah. Happy fight is a good fight, eh? That's hey? it, <laughs> that's it. All right, so... Let's uh let's give everybody a little bit of a spiel, you know. Uh how how would they support have you got a GoFundMe or something set up or No, I actually didn't put a GoFundMe page yet because I like I said I just moved into a new house that I bought. Yep. So um yeah, just yeah, anyone that does want to support me, but I uh, am I'm good. I'll probably put a post up soon about I'm taking sponsorships, anyone that wants yep. to sponsor me or put a bit of money in towards IMAF, like, you know, I'll um have a link there for it. Yep. Um is the best way to reach you on Instagram? Yes, best yep. way. Best way to reach me is on Instagram. I do all. I do mainly all my promotions and everything like up news feeds on Instagram, and and normally just um links with my Facebook and puts on my Facebook page. But if you want to reach out to me, Instagram is where to reach out. And yep. Daniel the Storm Mitchell, you'll find me first one. <laughs> little car, little cartoon version of me tensing. <laughs> so who who did the cartoon for you? Um. A guy called Alex. He's a um, designer. I can't remember his. I can't remember his um, business from the top of the head. But okay. um, yeah, my partner um, introduced me to him, and then yeah, he ripped up this awesome design, and yeah, we just went with it. It was awesome. That's oh, nice. Yeah, yeah it's, it's like a little, to have your little logo. Yeah, yeah. 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 I've got to give you a shirt. <laughs> uh, yeah. So merch wise, like, can people buy merch from you? Or, or yeah. You so I'm gonna. Um, at the moment, we're gonna we're working on a new shirt, but I got a storm cap. Yep. Which I'm. Yeah, so people can see that yeah. on the, if you're watching the video. If you watch the video, but yeah, so I will, um, everything that I do have merch wise, I put it on my um, Instagram. Yeah. So you you can just go scroll through. You see some of the old shirts, some of the new shirts. Um, we do have old shirts that we might we may give away or yep. Yeah, just if you want an old shirt, if you like the old design, we still got some like that. Yep. But um, yeah, with that. See, that's another learning thing, just working out like stuff like that. But mm. yeah, um, all the shirts always, all the money that is ever bought with my merch always goes towards my training, my traveling fees, um, any fees towards fighting, that all helps in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. No. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, let's uh, pull it up there unless there's anything else you want to talk about. No, that's it. I just um, follow, m- follow me on Instagram, Daniel the Storm Mitchell. I'm currently the number one band and weight fighter in the oceanic region hey. yeah got a and south pacific title under his belt south pacific and new south wales um and hopefully the world's coming up so follow me follow me through my instagram and watch my world journey to um the top yep and watch out for the pros <laughs> we're coming <laughs> <laughs> all right thanks everyone uh thanks johnny <laughs>